Today's guest is Dr. Michael Turner. He is an incredible physician and highly educated. He's a graduate of Stanford University, Harvard Medical School, and the Mayo Clinic, and has treated over 10,000 patients since 2009. He practices integrative medicine in his own national concierge practice, providing personalized approaches, including hormones, sleep, recovery, nutrition, supplements, and exercise to help people achieve their optimal state of health. He's called Jim genuine, caring, and quote, the best doctor in the world, end quote, by patients, which I love. And he brings a high degree of empathy, trademark optimism, and a holistic approach to patient care. So you can see why I had to have him on the show. By the way, he is the father of five children on top of all this. And he's just, wow, he just has such a, I would agree, just such an optimistic, clear approach to what really matters. And so that's what I really got in with him today. We're going to discuss what he calls his five life-changing truths of, of health and wellness. Um, he's very succinct and to the point and everything he says, I couldn't agree with more. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Here is Dr. Michael Turner. Okay. So Dr. Turner, you know, I was, as I was going through all of your stuff, your website and all of that, I just loved seeing like, obviously you're quite um, smart. <laughs> You're quite accoladed. You've got some good education under your belt. You've served over 10,000 patients. You've got a lot of experience under your belt, but I'd love to seeing what your patients had to say about you and just how much you care about them, how much they felt, feel that you care about them. And I was like, right on. That's, that's exactly what we need. Um, so it's such a treat to have you come talk to my people today on the podcast. So thank you for taking the time. Sure. Thank you. Very glad to be here. Um, I think probably as yourself, I enjoy what I do. You know, mm -hmm. like if I were independently wealthy tomorrow, I got an inheritance. I'd still show up to be Dr. Turner. You probably still show up to yep. do your mindset coaching, right? Because exactly. it's, it's what you are, what you have a passion for, what you enjoy. And that shows and what we do mm -hmm. and you end up caring more and, you know, it all just works together real well. Yeah. It's really fun and enlivening and invigorating and rewarding for sure. So all right. Yeah. Uh, there, I was telling you before we started, I'm like, it's when I interview people like Dr. Turner guys, it's tough. Cause I'm like, man, there's so many, he could go on. He could go off about so many different areas of health, but you have, um, what you call five life changing truths of health and wellness. So I thought that would be a great yeah. place to start. Can you share those with us? Glad to do it. Yeah. Let's jump right in. Let's talk about being in shape, cardiovascularly in shape, that feeling, right? Mm -hmm. This is life changing because the higher your VO2 max, and we'll go into what that means, the longer you live, essentially. Yeah. The more in shape you are, the longer you live. This has been proven. It's been documented. Yep. That's pretty astounding, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting. This harkens back a lot to the coining of the word aerobics, which is in the 1970s. Um, and so there was a really groundbreaking doctor. His name's slipping me right now, but he came through and he was in Texas and he was a cardiologist. And basically he had the idea of, hey, maybe we're doing it all wrong as regards heart attacks. Okay. Because the typical care used to be, oh, you had a heart attack. Well, you need to be on bed rest for a while because your heart right. is weakened, right? It's debilitated. Be careful. Don't do anything too much. And then slowly we let you off bed rest and slowly maybe you can walk around the block, et cetera. And he had the opposite mindset. He thought, well, your heart's damaged. It's weakened. We need to maximize the function of what remains in your heart. Let's get you up Let's get you going, right? So he was actually exercising his heart attack patients. They wanted to take his medical license away. They tried several times. They said he was dangerous. They said he was a quack, okay? Yeah. Um, he, of course, overturned the paradigm. He coined the word aerobics. Um, he Everybody started running in the 70s, if you remember this, like, you know, not only athletes like Prefontaine, but the whole like jogging revolution hit. And then the 80s, you had full-on aerobics, Jane Fonda, all this stuff. This all really came out of what he was doing. And um, then it progressed. And so actually Cooper, that's his name. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cooper just came to me, Kenneth Cooper. So then he started the Cooper Clinic in Dallas and he started nice. to marry science and physiology and data with, you know, observations, right? So like he knew people nice. were getting healthy, but he actually demonstrated and showed it. So he was the first one that showed that we can take your VO2 max, which is basically the measure of how cardiovascularly in shape you are. And the higher that goes, we can track it and we can show that you will live longer. And he published that date in the late eighties, early nineties, I believe. So it's extraordinary. It's such funny timing because I was just listening to my friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons book yeah. this morning. I was finishing up and she just shared that exact thing right there about VO2 max. And I was like, yes, because obviously as a trainer, which was my entry point into everything that I do now, yeah. big fan. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Here's a little, yeah. Here's a little subset life-changing truth right under that. Right. So the importance of aerobic shape VO2 max, but the subset little life-changing truth is that you can get in great VO2 max shape in four minutes a day. 
Nice. I love it. Just four minutes a day, yeah. right? This has been proven. Yeah. This is called Tabata, T-A-B-A-T-A, -A -A, right? Yeah. And he was a Japanese researcher. He was researching with the Olympic team, actually the cyclists. And he was very surprised. Um, he was comparing certain regimens of more medium intensity and long duration at the cycle versus all out intensity sprints for 20 seconds with 10 seconds of rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the people who are doing the all out sprints, 20 seconds on 10 seconds off times eight rounds, which is eight times 30 seconds is four minutes. Those people had equivalent anaerobic, uh, basically, you know, power output, uh, mm -hmm. better than the longer duration people, which you would expect they're doing power training. Okay, fine. That yeah. wasn't surprising. What was surprising was their aerobic function was nice. actually better, not just their anaerobic, both measures improved. That's... That was what was surprising about that study. Yeah. But you can get in great aerobic shape in as little as four minutes a day the, the, on a 20 on 10 off cycle. The, the kicker is it has to be very intense, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm talking sprinting on, you know, mm -hmm. your stair climber, I'm talking, uh, your Peloton, something like that, your cycle mm -hmm. bike, your, your mm -hmm. air bike. Um, yeah, those air dines will get you. Air dine will get you. I'm a big <laughs> fan of sprinting in place with hand weights. So caveat, I challenged myself about eight or nine years ago to run a six minute mile. Now, yeah. Some people that's nothing for me. It was a lot. Like I never did track growing up. I never did cross country. So here I am mm -hmm. like 40 years old. I weigh 215 pounds and yeah. I'm trying to run a six minute mile. Right. Well, yeah, and I'm busy. I'm a doctor. I got yeah. a family, all this stuff. Right. How did I train for that? The funny thing is, Tara, I pretty much never went to the track because I didn't have time to do that. Right. The, I, <laughs> the day I showed up on the track was basically race day. Okay. But how I trained was I sprinted in place with hand weights. 20 on 20 off. And nice. I would do like 10, 15 rounds. And I had eight pound hand weights at first. Then I progressed to like 12 pounders. Mm -hmm. And then I'd start doing with my, and holding my breath. Okay. So nice. if you sprint with hand weights and hold your breath, my friends, you will hit a level of intensity very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I did. And, and, and when I went out, I powered through that. I ran like a 559. I met my goal. It was tremendous. Yay. And I literally went to the track, I think maybe twice the whole time. So that is awesome. I'm a big yeah. fan. You know, boss Rutten has that O2 trainer. Maybe you've heard yeah. of, it's like a little thing you put in your mouth that restricts yep. how much yes. you can get in. So you get stronger, which kind of goes to this. Uh, what was the doctor's name again that you remember? Kenneth Cooper, Dr. Cooper. Yeah. yeah it kind of goes to Dr. Cooper points toward that. It's like, let's make it stronger. Mm -hmm. Let's make you stronger. And yeah, intensity is the name of the game. I did the same mm -hmm. thing qualifying for the Boston marathon by running way less. I don't run now, but mm -hmm. it was a huge part of my life for a long time running yes. way less lifting more, doing high intensity interval training instead of just these yes. long drawn out mid range intensity. I, of course I had to do some long runs, but man, like you're spot on. And that's really cool to hear that you did that like that and way to go. Cause six minute mile for a two fifteen guy with, I think you five kids you have, right. Yeah. And a yeah. busy practice. That's awesome. Yeah. What a success Thanks. story. <laughs> um, okay. Well, okay. It's number two, let's go on. Yeah. So number two, let's talk about cancer. Okay. Let's talk about the fact that most cancers are preventable and they have to do with your lifestyle, meaning decisions you make and not just most. So there's a study you can look it up quite simply. If you type in uh, lifestyle percentages due to cancer or something like that on Google, it uh -huh. will take you straight to PubMed and National Institutes of Health study. And basically epidemiologically, when they look at all this, it was 90 to 95% was the wow. number that they gave. Okay. Wow. 90 to 95 percent of cancers are preventable and have to do with your lifestyle not something genetic that your grandma and your mom or something just gave to you it's mm. the decisions you make now maybe some people find that as a burden but i find that as liberating right it means like yeah. it's within my control i don't have to worry about you know it just falling on me from somewhere genetic destiny it's actually what i control it's what i put into my mouth what i eat in terms of pesticides in terms of just obesity in terms of sugar in terms mm -hmm. of alcohol intake obviously smoking things like this. If we, if we cleaned up the lifestyle, we would be eliminating 90 to 95% of all cancer. What a number, what a message. And I'll yeah. just back you up on from my personal experience. My grandma, I'm 41. Mm -hmm. My grandma died when she was 40 from breast cancer. And as I've, you know, dived pretty deep into my own health, yeah. um, I have a slow calm T, which is a genetic predisposition to possibly have higher estrogens. Right. And granted, yeah. my 
grandma obviously didn't have that information. And she lived in a time where everyone's eating canned foods and, you know, the processed world really began. But having that knowledge now, I'm like, I, I don't live in any fear of getting breast cancer because I am living, I'm eating cruciferous vegetables and detoxing yes. and exercising and, you know, and so, yeah, it, yeah, sure. May, may we have a little bit of predisposition for, you know, not detoxing well or not metabolizing well. Sure. But it's so overcomable through lifestyle and 90 to 95% is insane. Thanks for sharing that number. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to do it. I would say number three, <laughs> would be if we ask ourselves, what's the single most important anti-aging concept, right? So people come to me for anti-aging health, wellness, right. you know, optimization and all that. And I, and there's a bunch of things we could do. We could obviously get their hormones, right? Why we could start them doing high intensity interval training. We could talk about deep sleep. There's all this stuff, but if I had to just pick one thing, one thing that carries the most weight for anti-aging, it's the health of your blood vessels. Okay. Vascular mm. health right here. Nice. Okay. Cardiovascular health. This is the most important anti-aging concept because it's responsible for two out of the top three causes of death. Let's just start there. Right. Yeah. So what is a heart attack? It's a blood clot in the arteries that feed your heart. So your heart pumps blood, of course, to the rest of your body, but it has recirculating arteries that circulate back on itself to feed itself because your heart's a muscle. It needs a blood supply. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are called the coronary arteries. What is the width of your coronary arteries? They're actually small, about two to three millimeters, okay? It's just not mm -hmm. large. So think about a headphone jack, like an aux cord, mm -hmm. A-U-X, right? You plug in a headphone jack, that's the width of a coronary artery. So yeah. if this little thing gets a blood clot in it, that's the definition of a heart attack, okay? So right. you've got some pr pretty primo real, real estate there that you've got to take care of. Yeah. So what happens if you have a blood clot in your brain? That's a stroke. So heart attacks and strokes are two out of the top three causes of death, the other one being cancer. Right? right. So if you have healthy blood vessels, you are now preventing the two out of the top three causes of death, not to mention every other organ system in your body, whether it's your calf muscle or your liver or your kidneys, yeah. right? right? It needs a certain amount of blood flow or your brain to do its job, right? Any right. organ pre uh, necessity uh, needs an amount of blood flow to do its job. It's just, it, it's a predetermined you mm -hmm. know, concept mm -hmm. for it. So if you lack blood flow, every organ system is failing, functioning suboptimally. Conversely, excellent cardiovascular health means every organ system is getting all the oxygen, nutrition, et cetera, that it needs. So, and top recommendations for healthy blood vessels? So top recommendations for healthy blood vessels. So, so exercise promotes nitric oxide release, which helps dilate blood vessels, right? Um, so definitely a low sugar diet. And that kind of segues into an anti-inflammatory concept. Yeah. So inflammation is very hard on blood vessels. This then gets into certain supplements like fish oil is one of my favorite, AKA omega-3 fatty acids, okay. right? So omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. They also produce healthy changes in your blood cholesterol levels. So particularly triglycerides. So as the omega-3 intake goes up, the triglyceride levels go down. This is very important in your cholesterol panel. There are three numbers you should pay attention to triglycerides, LDL and HDL. And particularly within the LDL, it's the small LDL particles that matter most. If you want to look up Dr. Robert Lustig, he talks a lot about this, L-U-S-T-I-G. He's amazing. So anyway, triglycerides, small LDL, and HDL. And all three of those have a role and those are important. We want triglycerides to be low. Fish oil or omega-3 fatty acids does that. So does a low-carb diet, by the way. So does exercise. I love we want, it. Yeah, we want small LDL particles to be low. Um, right. That is eliminating or uh, minimizing saturated fat. Saturated fat drives LDL particle numbers. Mm -hmm. The third thing is HDL. We want that to be up. That's a little harder to do. That's mainly genetic. Exercise helps that. Moderate alcohol also helps that. Mm -hmm. but, so in terms of getting the blood vessels in shape, we're talking about some of those dietary concepts that we just mm -hmm. mentioned, the low sugar, low saturated fat. We're talking about keep, you know, eliminating inflammatory uh, processes in your body, inflammatory triggers. And we're certainly talking about some consistent exercise, boosting nitric oxide on the nitric oxide vein. I'm a big fan of things like beetroot juice or beetroot powder boosts nitric oxide naturally. So does arginine. So I'm a big fan of arginine powder. You may be familiar with that. Mm -hmm. It's used as a pre-workout. It boosts nitric oxide, right? So I have a lot of people just taking that twice a day. Um, their blood pressure will go down, blood flow and circulation goes up everywhere in their body. So.
Awesome. I, I'm not sure if you've come across Dr. Nathan Bryan. He's a nitric oxide specialist, but if you haven't, mm-hmm. I'll have to send you his way. He's been on the show. He's awesome and just killing the game on nitric oxide oh, right now. Glad to hear it. PhD yeah. researcher. He's just awesome. So I'll have to send his info your way. Um, so yeah, Jeez. if you guys want to learn more about nitric oxide, definitely check that one out. I love all of these. And I love your uh, push for omega threes because I'm, the last time I read, I don't know if it's changed since then, but it was something like over 95% of Americans are below the RDA for yeah. omega-3, which is like usually not even optimal levels. And it was something yeah, like right. over 98% of children. Think about that with brain development and like the future of their health. Mm. That's one thing I definitely supplement for my kids. Cause I'm just like, Oh yeah. yeah you guys eat fish and like some omega-3 rich, you know, we get regenerative right. beef and stuff, but it's just right. not as much as you need, you know? So I love your push for that too. It's really needed. Absolutely. When my wife was pregnant with our first as soon as I was learning this, I was in medical school at the time at Harvard. We we're having our baby. And so as soon as she was pregnant, I'm like, we're starting fish oil. I go, yeah. there's two things you're starting, a prenatal right. multivitamin and fish oil. Okay. Because totally. that baby's developing brain needs that EPA and DHA. I'm reading all about this. I go, we got to stay on this. And totally. she did. She took that faithfully 3000 milligrams of omegas entire pregnancy. My kid's been on omegas fish oil ever since. Totally. Like, it makes a difference. So needed. And yeah. us, we're still developing our brains, yeah. even if we're past 25 or whatever, totally. because we're still alive. Our brain, we're all of our tissues are regenerating. So yeah, big fan of fish oil. Okay. Totally. Um, what are we on? Number four? I think we're on number four. Yeah. So we talked about uh, aerobic shape, VO2. We talked about cancer. We talked about cardiovascular health, blood vessels. Um, I'd say number four that's really life-changing is the power of your subconscious mind. Nice. Promote health. Yep. Your subconscious okay. mind, your mindset, healthy mindset, et cetera. Right. It's such a big deal. In my language. Um, cool. And I'd love to have it be a dialogue, you know, not just me saying it. I want to hear your aspects and input on it too, but this gets into things like you have to have a, you have to have a healthy mindset, a healing mindset before I can help you progress as a patient out of your problem. Mm-hmm. Right. Like for example, the simplest concept would be hope, right? If you come to me and say, I'm tired, I'm out of shape. I've seen all these doctors. I'm so frustrated. And you're pretty sure that nothing can be done. Then nothing can be done, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because you're, you're shut down, right? Mm-hmm. So the first thing I have to do is shine a ray of hope in your mind. And the more hope we can get in there, then the more sort of enthusiasm you're going to have to carry forward because change is hard, right? And you got out of shape and got sick over a period of time. It's going to take a period of time to get better, right? So I've got to sort of, put some wind in your sails and move you forward, but that's all mental, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you see no light at the end of the tunnel, then you're likely to to quit on this process on your healing journey somewhere. So we got to have a strong mindset that says I can get better. I know I will. It's just a matter of time. Keep on pushing the little engine that could, I think I can, I think Mm -hmm. I can like all of that stuff. It's a prerequisite to get you turned around uh, physically. Yeah. And I think, you know, just for sake of, uh, I I love to refer out as much as possible. Right. So if you want to dive deeper on that, I mean, really with subconscious mind is like, we're it's called unconscious for a reason, you know, that's the, it's, Mm -hmm. you can call it subconscious or unconscious. It's like, we don't realize, right. And these almost all come from childhood wounds of Mm -hmm. stories that we made up as little kids of, well, when my parents came to, you know, didn't mm-hmm. get me a birthday present one year, I just developed a story that I don't matter and people don't care about me. And mm-hmm. I didn't even yeah. realize that's been running the show forever. Or that one time when everybody else got an A on that test and I got an F, I just got this belief that I'm dumb and it's just been running the yes, show my totally. entire life, you know? And so I'd say my favorite resources are Dr. Bruce Lipton, Dr. Joe Dispenza, Byron Katie. Um, all of their books are really helpful resources. And then really, honestly, if you want to really, really dive into your subconscious mind, you need a coach, you need a therapist, you need somebody that can like actually get in with you. And that's why we see really intelligent people, super intellectually intelligent, not make it and not get what they want out of life because they don't realize it's all in this emotional body. Right. And these stories that are trapped in the unconscious of, I don't, other people can have that, not me, or I, you know, a deep, deep in the body, which uh, Dr. Candace Pert also is a great resource. She has a book called your body is your subconscious mind. Oh, wow. Um, Interesting. Yeah. She's the one who discovered the opioid receptor. Amazing woman, but oh wow. Yeah. She, that, that kind of stuff is like, you'd not, it's not here. Sometimes you got to have a skilled surgeon, so to say, help you get into your subconscious and pull that stuff out. So oh, yeah, big absolutely. fan of all this. <laughs> absolutely. I remember learning about cognitive behavioral therapy a little bit yeah. just as I went through, right. Some of my psychiatry and, 
Um, that's so important. You know, this is the idea of replacing these negative scripts that we run, right? right. It's like right. something bad happens. You're like, oh, that always happens to me, you know, or something right. bad. And you're like, it's just going to be a bad day. Well, what if you have a job interview later that day, right? And you wake up and it's raining and you stub your toe and you, you break, you know, your heel gets twisted as you get in the car. You're like, oh, it's just going to be a bad day. Well, now you've just tanked on the whole day, you know, mm -hmm. but, but what if you just put a, tell yourself something different, put a different record on in that same scenario to keep yourself sharp and optimistic. For yeah. The day. Right. Nothing totally. stops me. No exactly. Big deal. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Whatever. Yeah. Right. Like you've got to, I'm a big fan of three by five cards. I probably, you know, nice. I'm a geek about this stuff. I got them on my bathroom mirror. I've always got like two to three, three by five awesome. cards handwritten at all times with different little scripts that you could call them yes. affirmations or mantras yes. that I'm trying to put in my mind yes. to according to my current challenges of life. Yeah. It's extremely powerful. It's just replacing suboptimal store. It's programs. It's just like a computer. It's yes. just we're taking the, I find it very helpful to just replace with a new program. Cause sometimes I think yes. uh, we, as human beings, we tend to get stuck in like the problem versus like just instill a new, yeah, your, your computer's not working. Cause there's an update just available that you can just download. <laughs> and that's like those three by five cards. You're just like downloading new programs. It's like, Oh, yes. that's the program now. <laughs> yes, totally. You got yeah. it. You All got right. It. And then um, number, I'd say number five. Yeah. The last would be public enemy. Number one of health and wellness would be sugar. Um, yeah. and just understand that a little bit, right? Like it's so yeah. bad. Um, and we, we, I mean, I remember growing up, we kind of knew this as kids, you know, it's not good to have lollipops. You're supposed to brush your teeth because sugar's not good for you, but it's like, we didn't quite realize how bad it was now until, yeah. you know, more science has come out the last couple of days, you know, decades, as you may remember, um, this was like in the eight, late eighties, early nineties, it was more about low fat diets and like carbs and sugars were yeah. kind of unlimited. Right. And it was more just right. about, you know, avoiding, uh, fat, fat free but, skittles, fat, yeah, skittles, exactly. fat free, exactly. <laughs> Starburst, fat free. Exactly. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the sh sugar is just terrible to point out a couple things that people don't often realize it's pro-inflammatory. First of yeah, all, it is right. pro-inflammatory. I remember the first time a patient said something like, you know what, if I eat sugar, my back hurts. And I'm like, what? You know, I kind of raised the number like they never taught me that in med school, but I'm like open mind, you know, patients yeah. telling you the truth, you know, like pay attention, try to figure that out. Right. And then all of a sudden, a little bit later, I'm reading it's pro-inflammatory. And sure enough, if you start paying attention, you'll find people like, oh, I ate sugar. My hip arthritis feels worse or my knee, Absolutely. my injury from college, my athletics like kicks up. And anxiety, right? That yeah. anxiety, especially if you're sensitive, maybe yeah. ADHD prone or whatever. Oh, yeah. Just watch yourself when you've had it or people who are sensitive to getting anxiety. There's a gut microbiome impact on that, too. I just talked about this on my last episode um, because it blocks our ability that high fructose, right? Blocks our ability to convert glutamate, which is excitatory into GABA, oh. which is calming. It blocks the enzyme release for that. And then you look at inflammation on top of it. And we forget that our brains are one part of these, one of these organs. And if your brain is inflamed, you're not able to operate all the way. You're not getting nutrients delivered appropriately. You're not going to be able to just live in this calm, peaceful state. So I love that. And it circles back to your first one mm. with the, uh, or wait, it was your third one, blood vessels. No, what yeah, was your first vessels. one? My first one was aerobic shape and aerobic. Yeah. 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 And then, cancer, and then I guess I'm thinking, and then the third one was the blood vessels, but yes. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking that because you think of glycation, right. And that's what we yes. see with type two diabetes. Like those blood vessels get so hardened from that inflammation, that glycation over so many years. And so it's like in the meantime, before your stroke or your heart attack, you're mm -hmm. just living this like inflamed existence that you don't have to be living. Yes. Yeah. So that's huge. And I think with sugar, you know, cause I'm in the trenches with people on nutrition and I know you are too, in certain ways, even though you're doing all these other things, yeah. um, it's just, I have found my biggest piece of advice is to just start adding in things that you love to eat that don't have sugar in them. <laughs> Like, even if I heard your little video on your website, you were saying you loved honey nut Cheerios when you were yes. a kid. I was a little chubby kid too. And I loved cereal. I, even when I was adult, I loved cereal before I got healthy. I was eating all the yeah. Reese's puffs and even lucky charms and all of it as an adult at night, watching my TV shows, you know? Uh, and now like I sometimes have cereal. I just have a keto cereal that has high quality ingredients, no grains, no sugars. When I'm really need my yeah. fix for something like that with some almond milk or something, you know? Nice. Um, and so you can find these alternatives now and they're pretty easy to find. And once you have those put into place, like some Greek yogurt with some, you know, healthy granola, there's so many options, right? That maybe it's like a keto one or something. So it doesn't have all the sugars. 
it, you forget about you it really. I know that when you're in the throes of sugar, you can feel chemically addicted to it for sure. Right. You're mm-hmm. looking for that dopamine hit and all you don't have good stress management. That's like your one, one main tool for stress management. I get it. But a lot of it, I think is you really are just looking for the flavor profiles of something sweet. And there's a lot of options now. So that's just my little quick plug is like, find lots of things that you like to eat that just don't have sugar in them versus saying can't have sugar. Cause I've never seen the can't have sugar Mm -hmm. thing be very successful long-term for people. They start to get these weird, like bingey things going on with it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, (laughs) that's my point. Yeah, no, very good point. I like to talk to people about, you know, finding something that's sustainable and and moderation and such like that, right? Like if you go, I'm just never going to eat sugar again, again, that doesn't feel sustainable. I think you obsess about it. Yeah. Yeah. I might have little bits here and there and you're exactly right. If you're just not that worried about it, I just, it's, it's also goes into your relationship with yourself and your body. Cause it's like, I just don't really want to do a lot of that to my body, you know, thanks body for dealing with that. Cause it was Thanksgiving and that banana pie was really delicious, but I'm like, not going to do that to you all the time. Correct. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, okay. Let's see. We've got a a few more minutes here. I'm going to see how much I can get out of you. Okay, um, I love all everything you got. Um, we, I think we were going to, I wanted to ask you about, oh yeah. I wanted to ask you about bo- boosting human growth hormone naturally yes. is something you talk about. Can you share? Super important. Glad to do it. So first thing is deep sleep. You need to improve nice. the amount yeah. of deep sleep that you get. Right. So traditionally they just, uh, we defined four stages of sleep that deepest sleep, uh, so-called slow wave sleep is where growth hormone is released. Now, now that we have this ease of fitness trackers, I encourage everyone to get a fitness tracker, a sleep tracker, and you you can actually measure your amount of slow wave sleep. That should be a number that you know. It should be a metric. The more slow wave sleep, the more growth hormone release. Nice. The opposite is also true. If you're getting choppy sleep and you're really not getting much slow wave sleep, you're not getting much growth hormone release. So anything that you do that can promote slow wave sleep, you can just do an internet search. How do I improve slow wave sleep? That's Mm -hmm. the same thing as improving growth hormone release. It's released from your brain naturally every night but almost exclusively during periods of slow wave sleep. So that's the most important thing is get the sleep under control. Um, I think that has been my secret. I've been telling people that forever. I don't feel that I earned it. I will be straight up. I've always been the deepest sleeper. Like it was actually a really big problem in my life when I was younger because I would sleep in past school. But when I started tracking sleep cycles, I mean, I'm talking, I get like, I'll get like four hours plus of deep sleep every night, no matter what. Like I just, really, I like leave the planet. Like I am just gone. And I think that's been a huge part of my ability to build yes. muscle as a woman. It's just like, I've, I've always said that I'm like, dude, I just sleep like really, I don't know. I didn't earn it. I didn't do anything for it. I just sleep <laughs> real well. So I'm just saying, Amazing. like, I do think that has given me a little bit of an edge on my ability to build muscle. So if anybody's like really struggling to build muscle and you just heard that there are definitely things you can do, but in my opinion, with all the biohacky stuff I've done, you know, a lot mm. of my clients wear aura rings and track these things and we do mm. cold rooms and blackout curtains and noise things, and, you know, supplements and all of these things. But the biggest thing I've seen impact people's ability to get deep sleep is really, really dealing with the deeper stressors in their lives mm. in their daily lives. Like, re- like going all in on like therapy or a coach or like something like that to get their nervous system more regulated. Yeah. Yeah. Or if they're not exercising or over exercise, you know what I mean? It's, it's nervous system dysregulation, I think is what really is the big thing. And that's, that's like deeper work usually than I have found than just taking a supplement or making your room black out. So those things help. But if you really want to get there, I think it's like, yeah, stress management. Um, Okay. And that was my, la- Oh, did you have something to add? There are just a, a couple real quick. We can move on, but uh, so slow wave sleep is number one. Number two oh, is sweet. your, okay. yeah. Your high intensity interval training concepts, this boosts okay. growth hormone. Yes. I remember yes. um, I read an article where even a 30 second all out sprint, just one 30 second all out sprint growth hormone will rise for maybe nice. an hour and a half afterwards. It's pretty striking. Um, wow. And this actually gets into CO2. So your CO2 levels, as they build up under, mm-hmm. for example, high intensity exercise conditions, the higher the CO2 in the blood, that is a trigger directly for growth hormone release. So that's the okay. mediator. That's the reason why. Um, okay. And then the other thing is protein in your diet. So some people don't realize this, but if you eat protein, it will trigger growth hormone release always. It's just the way that your body is designed. One of the things growth hormone does, as you may know, is it takes amino acids and turns them into muscle. It's 
anabolic in that sense. Mm -hmm. So even if I sit here right now and do no exercise, but I eat 30 grams of protein, I'm going to get a growth hormone boost. So what you do is you take some protein right at bedtime when you're going to have your slow wave sleep and it's synergistic. So I end every day with about 30 grams of whey protein. I take my melatonin and some other things right before bedtime. And I know that there's going to be the synergistic wave of growth hormone kicking off over the next few hours. Nice. All right. You're so good at breaking these things down. Super easy to digest and and process. Appreciate it. And that was the last thing I just want to hit with you is sleep. You know, okay. you call this the, the neglected pillar of health. And I yeah. will preface this real quick by just saying, like, I keep telling people, I'm like, when I got my circadian rhythm set and started getting my bedtime and wake up time consistent, it was as profound a life change for me as when I went through my huge health and fitness transformation. It was that profound of like my day to day reality just became amazing. My mood, it became effortless to stay lean and strong, uh, manage my life, like profound. So I'm a big, big fan of sleep. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Oh, fantastic. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, the first thing that people don't quite realize is sleep has a direct and profound effect on your immune system. Let's just talk about that, right? We got cold flu season. We got COVID, of course. Your immune system is as only as strong today as the quality of sleep you got last night. Yeah, okay. it's an immediate direct turnaround. It doesn't matter how well you slept two nights ago or a week. It's last night. Just to put an emphasis nice. on that, there Love was a that. study they did where they took perfectly healthy and perfectly well-rested people. Okay. And then just for one night, they restricted them to four hours of sleep, got them up in the middle of the night, took yeah. them to the lab, isolated one of their most important white blood cells, which is called the natural killer cell NK. And they put that natural killer cell in a Petri dish and then bombarded it with different kinds of challenges like different viruses, bacteria, and such. And they were measuring how active are the natural killer cells. Well, it turns out if you take a perfectly healthy, perfectly well-rested person, but give them only four hours of sleep, their natural killer cell function drops off 30%. Okay. That's just one night. So what would a week, right? Or what would a lifestyle poor sleep do? The answer is your immune cell function number and, you know, uh, activity and function is just tailing off. So the emphasis and the connection between sleep and your immune system is huge. This is why I tell people also when you're sick, you feel sick and tired, right? You don't just feel sick. You feel sick and tired. Why is that? It's a natural part of your response to sickness. Your body literally in your brain, there are different chemicals that get released that tell you to feel sedated and tired. Your body's trying to give you a signal, put me to sleep because when I, as soon as I get to sleep, I will start fighting this infection. Again, when we're fighting of something, we think that we're down there just 24 seven fighting, let's say COVID or the flu or whatever. It's really Mm -hmm. not like that. It's heavily weighted towards sleep, right? Let's just say the 80, 20 rule just for argument's sake. So 80% of you getting over your pneumonia or your sickness or whatever actually happens when you are asleep. Mm -hmm. Not when you're awake. That's when your body does the heavy lifting from an immune viewpoint. That's when it replenishes white blood cells from your bone marrow. It kicks out new antibodies from your bone marrow. Everything really kicks into high gear. So Mm -hmm. sleep and immune system are like hand in glove concepts there. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that to light. Yeah. Um, Any other big hitters on sleep? Big hitters on sleep. I would just leave you with two more. So how about sleep in Alzheimer's? I mean, who doesn't care about that, right? So it turns out that these waste products that build up the beta amyloid protein, um, mm-hmm. particularly, it's cleansed out of your brain every night, but again, only during the deepest stages of sleep. If you don't get those deep stages of sleep, you're never getting a full rinsing or cleansing of these waste products. They slowly build up over time. As they build up, they create Alzheimer's. So the link between poor sleep and Alzheimer's is well established, but the opposite's also true, therefore, right? Great mm-hmm. deep sleep, consistent rhythm, as you're saying, clearance of all of these metabolic waste products, Alzheimer's risk negligible. Nice. Very, very important. The other thing I would mention is weight gain. So the connection between poor sleep and weight gain is very strong. We know, for example, that with shift workers, you can take someone shift working, you know, eight hours now, graveyard, this and that, they will gain weight. Totally. Inevitably. Even if they don't eat anything different, even if they still go to the gym and exercise and do the same Mm -hmm. routine, if you disturb their sleep, they will gain weight. Why is that? Because you've got certain hormones that work on a circadian rhythm, right? And particularly growth hormone, right? I just got done yeah. saying, if you don't get that deep sleep, you're not getting enough growth hormone release. Well, what's growth hormone have to do with weight? Well, a lot. Growth hormone is a powerfully fat burning molecule. It's arguably the most powerful fat burning molecule you yeah. have in your body. More totally. than testosterone, more than anything else is growth hormone. Mm-hmm. It just strips fat off of you. So mm-hmm. crummy sleep equals minimal growth hormone release. Mm-hmm. On the flip side, you've got hormones that do surge Uh, under conditions of poor sleep, like ghrelin and leptin, if you've heard of these. And so you get dysregulated, you have less of the fat 
fighting hormones and more of the hunger and fat storage yeah. hormones because yeah. the whole system didn't get to reset itself enough and you will gain weight, unfortunately. Yeah. I've had clients that, you know, nurses typically it's like, they really get hammered on this one a lot. It's if, if they're especially in hospital environments, you know, and yeah. I've had them, they were able to get into, they found a new position where they could have like a regular schedule and boom, just after that, just not only that, it wasn't just the weight. It was like their whole mental wellness, you know, like oh, how yeah. they felt like just, they just were like, wow, like I feel so much better. And I, I you know, I don't mean to <laughs> depress anybody who is in that boat right now, but man, if there's any way you can get out of that situation, just True. keep looking for it. Cause it's, it's tough on your, on your health, on your mental well being, all of it. So yeah, I love that. And then the, the, I'll just add like the insulin sensitivity, right? When you, yes. the studies that have shown like four hours of sleep like that and like your ability to manage your blood sugar well goes down dramatically, yes. right? So yes. that's, yeah, weight gain, but like the weight gain is really just a symptomology of something that's much deeper and more concerning based off everything we just talked about in the beginning of the episode with your blood vessel health and your, yes. you know, dementia risk and all of that is huge. So sleep is like, I mean, there's a reason that if we don't do it, our bodies are like, you're going down. <laughs> yeah. You're going to sleep now. <laughs> Truly. So, well, you yeah. can, you can literally die from lack of sleep. I mean, if you, it's, it's used in warfare times, you know, uh, you know, right. you can lay seat. Yeah. They'll, 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 <laughs> I remember, I remember reading about this and like some psych ops thing that we were doing in the middle east or something but you know you the, the humvees were blasting like led zeppelin you wow. know 24 7 to make sure the enemy got no sleep because the first thing that will happen is you'll start hallucinating okay you'll start seeing things that aren't there and hearing things that aren't there and and then you'll lose your mind and then you will die so wow. there's literally a physical period of time i don't know what the number is but Crazy. you know devious minds have studied this where if you give a human being no sleep you will kill them wow um, yeah. yeah makes sense so anyway yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. This is all so great. I wish so, but he has like a list of like 50 million things he can talk about. And I wish we could get into all of them guys, but we will, I'll have to turn you over to his website. It's, uh, is it Michael Turner MD? Sorry. I just had it pulled up. Dr. Turner. What's your website? Well, I have two different ones. Yeah. So okay. Michael, my, yeah. Michael Turner MD, uh, all one word.com is, uh, my main website. And then I'm on Substack where I have a blog and my podcasts are found as well. And that's Dr. Turner, um, drturner.substack.com. Okay. Awesome. And we'll say, and then, uh, do you work with people remotely? I do. Yeah. I have people okay. all over the country and even internationally, several. Okay. Awesome. We will link that up in your social medias and anything okay. that you want to share with anybody in terms of like how to learn more from you or work with you or anything you have coming up or. Yeah. Well, words. you know, you can check me out on those two websites that I mentioned. Um, I've got some coaching cohorts I'm going to start in the new year. I've got a lot of educational ideas that I want to do. I used to be a nice. school teacher. So okay. one part of me is physician. One part of me is sort of health coach and, you know, practitioner. Mm -hmm. And I kind of mm -hmm. believe that I live the message as well. But yeah. then a big part of me is an educator. I was actually a classroom mm -hmm. teacher before I went to med school. So oh, I really cool. want to pump up the education side and get, get, get high quality information to people. I have a passion for that. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, follow him on social media and check out his website, guys, if you want to learn more about that. And man, thanks. You are really a jack of all trades, Dr. Turner. <laughs> like you are like physician, health coach, you know, a uh, healer, just I'd say healer all around and educator. So we really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us today. Thank you. Sure. That's very kind. Glad to do it.